uh, looking at the uh, appointment of the auditors and the election of trustees for the next year. Um, so that's um, so, so that's my general introduction. Um, so now, now um, I'd like to introduce Liz Ballard, our chief executive. And as I said, if you want to ask questions, please put them in uh, the, the uh, chat box uh, during this talk and during the talk of Derek Cow afterwards. So Liz, um, please, uh, your review of the year. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, I'm going to share a PowerPoint. So just uh, hang on a moment while I share my screen. So hopefully everyone can see that. Can I have a yes from someone? Um, it's just I can't. No, I can now, Liz. Uh, Liz, it's big again. If you can. Um... If you want to exit and restart it. Is that okay? Yeah, that's it. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, yes, a year in review. And I think we can safely say that last year was a year like no other for all of us. Um, uh, COVID-19 affected everyone. Uh, and we all had to manage with uh, COVID-19 in, in many different ways. But I think if uh, something good is to come of what happened last year, when we reflect on it, it was incredible how wildlife seemed to be uh, all around us. Perhaps we had more time to stand and stare. Maybe we just uh, were taking time out to our local patch was amazing uh, and I guess uh, there was um, more opportunity for wildlife to thrive undisturbed uh, and so I think it was quite an incredible year last year for many reasons um, as well as very challenging and perhaps nothing uh, more symbolizes last year to me than the incredible visit by the bearded vulture that um, flew and soared over Sheffield and beyond on its um, 2.9 meter, I think it was, wingspan. And it just symbolized for me just how um, we can think so much bigger and so much uh, more inspirational about what can be achieved if we really put our minds to thinking about bringing back wildlife. So uh, on that note, this is just a fairly uh, quick review of some of the, the kind of highlights as well as I can make them from last year. Um, we did manage to achieve an awful lot uh, despite the restrictions uh, with much help from, from yourselves. So thank you. Uh, and we'll be more on that in a, in a minute. So I'm going to talk about um, a little bit of an overview of our sort of three key areas, our network for nature, connecting people and taking action for nature, and then a brief look ahead. So to start with the network for nature, this is very much about creating space for nature, making sure it's connected and giving places um, a, a space for, for wildlife to, to thrive. So identifying spaces for wildlife to thrive. Uh, and this picture of an osprey is because we did uh, do some work last year just exploring what the feasibility was of uh, trying to attract osprey through the Sheffield Lake. Um, and this is because we, we know osprey has been uh, um, flying overhead for some years. We often see it often stop, they often stop towards the west of Sheffield. And so um, we know also that a number of sites, uh, such in this, as the strongholds in Cumbria and in Leicestershire, they are sort of expanding and looking for other sites. So, well, you know, why not Sheffield? Um, so we are exploring, uh, we started to explore that um, last year, and there's, there's obviously more work to do on that. Uh, and we also, um, through our Sheffield Lakeland landscape work, both focused on other species like the, the water vole, the, the, the vole that is often referred to as ratty and wind in the willows. Uh, and through the, the uh, work that we've been doing to the west of Sheffield, we've been able to identify some water vole populations. So this is really good news because there was at one point a suggestion that uh, it will have become extinct in South Yorkshire. 
um, predated by mink and struggling uh, through habitat loss. So if we have got uh, some important local populations, we think um, probably they're hanging on because they're in the upper catchment, a bit away from where a lot of the disturbance might be, where mink might be. Uh, so, so this is a really uh, hopeful story, actually, and we, we're looking at this um, sort of remnant population and thinking about how we can work with that, how we can conserve it, how we can help the waterfalls to flourish and thrive um, in Sheffield and hopefully beyond. So uh, we're developing a species recovery plan for the waterfall with the council, with partners, and hope that there's some opportunities to, to protect what we've got, but also help it to recover. Um, and if you go up to Redmines, you may um, see uh, water voles up there. They're, they're quite common to see. And we've done some work to fence off some protect them from being attacked by wayward dogs who um, get excited because they think they uh, are rats and fun to chase. Uh, so there's still more to do on this, but it's a real, um, really exciting uh, area of work. And We've made some, some kind of a really fantastic discoveries by engaging with farmers on the west of Sheffield. Uh, some of them are the lifelong tenants of, of farms on Sheffield City Council's rural estate, and many of them work in quite traditional low intensity ways uh, and are real gems for wildlife because of that, and present a really great opportunity for nature recovery. Uh, and this is a wonderful small functioning bog, it's actually functioning, expanding, sphagnum is growing, peat is forming. So this is what all our bogs and moorlands should really kind of look like. And in other areas where perhaps the land looks a little bit more boring uh, for wildlife perspective, um, we've started to put in scrapes and plant trees where appropriate to support the, uh, particularly these scrapes support a strong, uh, stronger breeding population, which we, breeding wages population which we have up on the west of Sheffield and certainly as soon as these were in we started to see uh, breeding wages appearing which was fantastic and a lovely lovely snipes here was was, was um, spotted and so through this work we are basically influencing 700 or more and counting hectares of land so it's a really interesting approach for us and a bit of a different way of working that we really want to expand on. Elsewhere, we've uh, done work on the River Rother, putting uh, buns into the fairly boring canalised channel of the Rother, trying to make it more interesting, slowing the current in some places, increasing it in others, which is great for things like fish fry and, and uh, insects as well. So hopefully a really kind of further um, positive project for, for our rivers. And our Doughty have been planting trees and putting in ponds all over the place. Uh, they've put in no end of uh, ponds, particularly recently, and some of them on our nature reserves, which are doing really well. We already have some great crested newts moving into those new ponds. Uh, so some really exciting species and habitat work going on. Lots more, more to do, of course. And we looked after our nature reserves, as we always do uh, throughout the year. So thinking about the work of connecting people with nature, uh, we, we kind of obviously had to just adapt straight away with COVID-19 and lockdown. There was no more face-to-face -face engagement. So we quickly learned how to use Zoom and Teams like everybody else did. Uh, we we um, set up something called Nature Adventures, which provided videos and blogs and supported nature-based activities, uh, which were really popular. And this particular video uh, was uh, viewed thousands of times, it appeared on national television, it went, it went uh, pretty viral. Uh, and then we had uh, Nature Natters, some, some wildlife talks, which were really popular. Uh, just 20 or 30 minutes on a particular subject, water bowls, butterflies, barn owls. And our Wild at Heart and Natural Neighbours teams who normally engage directly with people um, adapted, they, they resorted to the good old phone, picking up the phone to people, posting activity packs, packs and just keeping in touch as best they could, reaching over um, 700, nearly 800 people directly through that. Uh, and we, we, were, we launched a really great online guest speaker program, and one of those is obviously tonight with, with Derek. So we really have learned uh, quite a lot from uh, never having used Zoom before to suddenly being in a um, very different place where it was becoming a key part of our engagement. And a lot of you sent us some nature events.
Yeah, and uh, I've just got a quick selection of some of those because they are really stunning photographs. So uh, just a few here from various people, beautiful mountain hair there and uh, ducklings, of course, always uh, um, very uh, cute, of course. Um, stunning picture of Grano Woods. Um, so thanks to uh, Chris Thompson for that and Carhouse Meadows looking great. Um, uh, the uh, Blackamoor um, deer are, are amazing, of course, always uh, get lots of uh, great photos of those. So thank you for sending in those brilliant photos. Then uh, we also managed to carry on some volunteering. It was pretty tough uh, with lockdown. There's obviously a lot of restrictions in place, but we still had over 160 active volunteers who contributed 8,600 hours of work and support to us, to our conservation efforts and our, our back office work as well. Here's some uh, volunteers planting trees at Woodhouse Washlands. Uh, and of course, it was uh, an interesting time because the schools closed, so it was really challenging to do outdoor learning. Uh, but we did, towards the uh, end of the year, manage to, to work with a number of schools um, out and about and in their school grounds. Uh, and then in terms of campaigning, uh, you know, we didn't stop, we just carried on and, uh, you know, such a critical part of our work, taking action for wildlife. So um, a particular site that will be familiar to some of you on the call, I, I'm sure, will, will be Althorpe, which took up a lot of our, our time and effort. A city council site that has been allocated for housing for about 30 years and, and not been built on. Uh, carved up into sort of three sites and site E was the focus of attention as it had been so sold to Avent Homes uh, to, to build on just uh, uh, in the last year or uh, to a local wildlife site, which you can see is in that kind of uh, pinky purpley colour there. So, so not great in itself to have housing so close to an important local <coughs> wildlife site, but uh, also, um, you know, really disappointing to see uh, a housing site on something which over 30 years has basically transformed from a really quite dull arable farm land into this really amazing mosaic habitat, you know, which really is a, a kind of rewilding example in its own right. So uh, we, we unfortunately, well, fortunately, we managed to persuade the council to refuse the application, which is a real success, but then unfortunately, we're not successful in persuading the planning inspector to to turn down the Avent Homes appeal. So sadly, this has now been lost uh, and uh, we, we have to fight and carry on defending sites C and D. But at least uh, the plans at Loxley Valley were refused by city council and then refused by planning inspectors. So there were some, some gains around the city. Uh, and we positively kind of moved on to uh, releasing the partnership tree strategy, uh, street tree strategy and recruited some tree wardens, which is great, uh, and continued some work around action for insects. Uh, and many of you got involved in work to support uh, action for insects in your own gardens, which is brilliant. And many of our members engaged and supported our campaigns, for instance, around the environment bill, which is going to be really critical for us going forwards. So uh, just briefly mentioning some things to look ahead at. Um, we've got lots going on with local nature recovery strategies, work on the river rather, more work with farmers, woodland creation starting to take off in South Yorkshire, and obviously all that work on species that we've talked about, bringing back beavers, uh, question mark. So uh, very relevant tonight. Uh, how we engage with more people and using some of the tools that we've learned over the last year with our online events, which have been really um, great for engaging lots of people, and then how we can um, further continue our work to take action for uh, nature and wildlife, relying very much on, on you for your help and support to raise the voice for um, standing up for nature. So just to say thank you very much for, for all your support over this really strange year that we had last year, challenging for so many of us, but that connection for nature felt very strong for so many of us, I think. And uh, um, without your support uh, and, and help and encouragement, of course, none of this would be possible at all. So, so thank you um, very much for, for being here tonight and for all the support that you gave us over last year in particular. 
So I'm going to finish there and uh, stop sharing my screen and I will um, uh, just start to introduce Derek, our guest speaker tonight. So um, Derek, as I think many of you know, is a specialist in water bowl conservation and surveys and uh, breeding, reintroduction, and mitigation, and uh, many things um, around mammals and some uh, fantastic species uh, of wildlife that we have. Um, he's recently brought out a book, Bringing Back the Beaver, the story of one man's quest to rewild Britain's waterways. And uh, it's, um, uh, you know, fantastic uh, to see how this work is really taking off. And uh, we really hope that soon we will see um, work uh, ongoing to, to bring beavers back to Sheffield and Rotherham. So without no more ado, I shall uh, pass over to, to Derek and look forward to hearing you. Thank you very much. You might be on mute, Derek. I'm on mute. Oh, you've gone on mute, you've gone off mute, you've gone on mute again. <laughs> no, you still can't hear you, Derek. I'm really sorry. That's Is it. that working now? That's it. Perfect. Great. That's Thank you. great. You messed a bit what I swore at the screen then. Um, so I'm going to pass over to Rebecca and ask, Rebecca, how do I change these slides? I just say next slide. Yes. Woo, well done, you. Okay. Yeah. So the beaver as a, as a species is no novel species in a British context. Approximately a million years ago, the first hominids reached this place we call Britain. And regardless of how those people looked, um, you know, as the gaps in the ice opened um, and allowed um, human occupation, at virtually every occasion, the folk that came decided they were going to stay near wetlands. Wetlands were <clears throat> places where there was an abundance of fish and waterfowl, or big game animals coming down to eat. And the archaeologists could demonstrate quite well that they were sites that were used eternally by people. Next slide. Because the only issue wasn't just the, the fact that you had a, 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 an abundance of provender there. The other issue was, of course, that you wanted to live in a complex environment, separated perhaps, um, you know, by, by, by channels and islands, um, you know, from, from things like the very many big cat species that existed in those different times. Because, of course, at that point in time, we were not the kings in the landscape. They were. Next slide. Beavers were everywhere. The landscapes that we selected were used by them. And we still see um, sometimes if we look at old maps and contemporary names, um, you know, widespread abundance of, sort of place names that testify um, to, to, to the former abundance of beavers. Next slide. Um, they were animals which we utilised in a whole variety of different ways. The harp bag, for instance, in the Viking burial ship at Sutton Hoo was comprised of three um, beaver skins turned inside out to caress this, this, this soft and delicate musical instrument. Next slide. Um, there are some wonderful old stories and legends in the sixth century um, when St. Felix was, um, you know, was, was, was shipwrecked in the mouth of, of, of a village called Baddingley um, in Suffolk, um, you know, his attempt to bring Christianity to the Angles. Uh, his life was saved by a family of beavers, and in response, he 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 made the um, the king beaver archbishop of his family, and the archbishop beaver then went on to consecrate many of his junior family members. Next slide. There are laws with regard to the pelts of the animals. They were an animal that was used quite commonly as a valuable fur bearer. And, and a thousand years ago, the laws of Hoyle Da, the King of Wales, uh, beavers were demonstrably worth very much more, principally because they were a larger animal than, than other variable fur bearers like Herman and Martins. Next slide. And there are some lovely accounts. Another um, travelling um, churchman, Geraldus Cambrensis, Geraldus of Wales in 1180, have recorded that on the river Tyvee, in a location where there's a church, a mill, a bridge, a salmon lead, an orchard with a delightful garden, that all stood together on a small pot of land, uh, and the Tyvee was the only river in, in Wales which had beavers. Geraldus was not describing a wilderness. Next slide. So we have lived with beavers before, but when you look at, you know, it's barely possible now 
for us to imagine when you look at Nant Frankham in Wales, the, the Vale of the Beaver, and you look at this treeless wasteland, I just and when you, you have the opportunity to travel to look at a range of different rewilding projects, right the way through Britain, as I've very luckily been able to do over the course of the, um, of the last two years, you know, time and time again, you go to special sites, you see one or two things that are really quite amazing, most of which are, are entirely in decline. And you, then you look at the ruin and the level of it. This was once a wetland full of all wildlife. And look at it now. Next slide. And the under layers of the soil, you can see some of their burrows and some of the canals are still there. But that environment in Wales wouldn't be capable now in modern times of supporting beavers. Next slide. Again and again, their burrows appear in different in the course of different river systems. But these are all the eroding facets of their once being, and they too are fading fast. There will, it would be very much longer before any evidence of this sort has gone. Next slide. Um, and beaver, beaver bones have been found in association with them for as long as archaeologists have looked. In 1837, um, in the course of the Old River Stour, an archaeologist who ever, and, uncovered the bones of what looks like a relatively fresh beaver um, said that he really couldn't see you know, how on earth the animal entered its abode um, you know, from other, any other mode um, you know, other than underwater. And of course, we know from contemporary modern experience of beavers throughout their wide um, North American Europe and European range that these burrows they make in the bank sides are quite typical um, of them creating um, you know, burrows into the banks and chambers at the end um, where they live in great comfort with their families. Next slide. And this is the beaver um, that was unearthed. Um, from Keenston Mill on top of a boiler in the back room of the um, of a museum in Dorchester. Next slide. They appear in, in prints and, and, and manuscripts. Um, you know, gnawing on, on a branch with their webbed feet and flat tail. Next slide. But perhaps more, 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 um, you know, in, in, in a more absurd context, you have all sorts of odd beliefs that, that start to emerge. Because one of the reasons why there are no beavers here anymore was that we hunted them very heavily. We hunted beavers right the way through the Eurasian range from Great Britain um, to China, you know, up to the Arctic Circle, down into the Mediterranean Basin, because we wanted the scent glands that these animals have in their cloaca at the base of their tail, um, because these scent glands in their own right contain a very high concentration of salicylic acid, which is a basic ingredient of aspirin. And it was believed in the Middle Ages that in order to save their lives, the beavers would castrate themselves because it was believed the scent glands were their testicles, hand the glands to the hunter, and the hunter would then save their life. Next slide. Um, this kind of castoreum, this is what relatively fresh castoreum glands look like. Um, the substance when it's fresh is, 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 is a, a, a clear yellow viscous fluid, but it eventually will dry um, you know, when it's hung on a beam to form a kind of harder compound that can be ground with a mortar and pestle to resemble demerara sugar, and then it can be used as an infusion in drinks. Next slide. But not everybody was so gullible. I mean, if you look at the, the records of beaver, beavers from the Fertile Crescents, you have um, you know, different um, antiquities, antiquarians or, or naturalists telling you that this belief was false and that the animal didn't castrate itself. Indeed, it wasn't possible um, for it to do so because its testicles were stuck like those of pigs, uh, and therefore this story was just a nonsense. Next slide. Um, it was recorded by the Romans that the, the castorium could be used for all manner of different treatments from insomnia to mania to epilepsy to dyspepsia and even to some fairly trivial conditions like hiccups. Next slide. There was considerable confusion actually like um, the compound was, was, was a, a major trade item in all of the principal um, routes of trade access across the Silk Roads from the Mediterranean, you know, up into down into Africa, across into the Middle East, into China and far beyond. Very few people had actually seen what a beaver looked like. Next slide. And there were all sorts of descriptions of them, which are quite fantastical. So the castor is an animal adapted to living both in the water and out of it, but mostly living in water. It feeds on fish and crabs, as testicle, John Badaspar. This animal is fit to live both on land and in the sea, but he's usually found in streams with snakes and crocodiles. Well, maybe that was possible once upon a time, but in, in North America, where the beavers meet the alligators, and the beavers finish fairly abruptly. Next slide. 
castor, castoria, that was a compound that was used right into modern times in apothecaries' um, shops right the way through Western Europe. Next slide. And indeed, if you again look at Britain, you have places like Beverston and Gloucestershire, which record uh, one, uh, the, the once flourishing trade in, in, in beaver parts and, uh, and skins and, and glands, um, you know, from the, the rich wetlands of the Somerset levels up to the castle at Beverston in the early Middle Ages. Next slide. So we also have records until relatively, you know, went to well into modern times of trades and timers of beaver pelts, packs of pelts come, for example, from rivers like the Tyne. Next slide. Then the and, and the, the 12th to 14th centuries, um, during the reign of um, Henry the First, um, there, there were taxes placed on these pelts. Next slide. Until relatively recent times, some, some natural historians have said, well, this is possibly a trade item passing through, and, and, and maybe they were just being imported from somewhere else. The tax was being put on them, and they were being re-imported. -import, but in... in on um, various different natural historians walking up Scott, Burn, and Kielder discovered some rather odd sticks pointing out the bank. Next slide. They had a look at these, they were radiocarbon dated, and it became very clear that these were beaver felled sticks and that they dated back um, to around the, the, um, the 14th century. Next slide. And as soon as you look, you know, until relatively recently, well into my time, um, you know, if you read a book about the history of British mammals, you'd be told that beavers became extinct uh, a thousand years ago because people just repeated the stories of Cambrensis, which were easy to find. But as soon as you start to look, you find other stories. You find this account from William Harrison, which is not repeated um, before 1577, or it's not mentioned before 1577. And he says, I must tell you something of the beaver. It's, it's like a, a large rat. Its hind feet and tail are only supposed to be fish. Certainly the tail of the beast is like a thin whetstone as the body unto a monstrous rat. The beast itself is a such force in its teeth. It'll gnaw a hole through a thick plant and shear through a double billet in a night. They'll love us the stillest of rivers. I've worked with beavers now for over a quarter of a century, and one of the first things that impresses them, you know, on your conscious when you do, is just how powerful they are and their jaws are when it comes to, 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 to searing through wood. Next slide. Um, and there are other nebulous names still. There are places in Scotland, you know, which, which testify to the fact that within living memory uh, in the late uh, 1800s, um, there were accounts of beaver and beaver place names there. Next slide. And these were place names that were verified by people of, of upstanding ability within their communities to ensure that when the, the first ordnance served officers went, at, went out into communities and asked for place names, that there was something to actually back them up. So one, one um, prominent member of a community would be asked, and then another prominent member would be asked to support what the, the, the first one had said. So we can be reasonably confident that in these early accounts in the late 1770s, the people were actually speaking about beavers and not any other species at that time. Next slide. And, and this, this, this evidence of them existing um, within living memory, you know, it's slight, but it starts to build. Next slide. At a place called Bolton Percy, just beneath York, there's a very interesting bounty record. Next slide. Um, and it records that in 1789, one John Swale is paid um, tuppence for a beaver head, and the clerk and um, who, who too paid him for the beaver head on the following page of his ledger, in the same right handwriting, record paying somebody else a shilling for an otter. Next slide. In more modern times, um, you know, writers who, who described this event said, well, it's not actually beavers at all, it's otters. Um, they made a mistake. This is not a beaver. Beavers couldn't have survived so late. So when the wood reeves paid these two to three pence for the head of a beaver, they were people who were wrong. Next slide. But there's absolutely no evidence this was the case. The wood reeves um, were, 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 were people who were um, originally formed as a, a, a taxation service for forests or, or for other um, you know, areas of countryside utility in the time of the Normans. They, and, and in their, 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 their period of, of operation, they were, not, they were not gamekeepers. They weren't interested at all in wild boar or deer or the damage that any other wild animal um, did. All they were concerned about was the damage to the forest. And therefore, it makes no sense that people like this um, were paying a shilling 
um, you know, for otters when otters were of no concern to them. So it's very likely that the Woodreeves, in paying the two to three pence, were actually paying it for an animal which did impact the forest. And that forest at a time when withy was valuable um, and a very useful commodity was for the beaver heads. Next. Interestingly, about um, six weeks ago, um, even though we can never be certain, I went to meet this, this lady, this 91-year-old lady called Catherine Birkinshaw um, on a bridge at Wentworth Woodhouse. Next slide. She can recall when she was very small, and I'm not quite sure whether you can see the dots on this, and there are three little orange dots. Um, one is for Beverly, which means um, beaver meadows, um, you know, in Old English. Um, and these, are, these three dots are all on the, um, on, on, on the Humber. One, the other is for Bolton Percy, um, which is the one to the, um, uh, the far north of the illustration. And the one to the far south is also on the Humber from Wentworth Woodhouse. And in 1930, Kathy said that she could remember seeing beavers building a dam beneath the bridge we were standing on. She was taken there several times as a small girl by her father. She described the animals very well. And when you look at the woodland that surrounds the bridge to this day, though there's no other evidence of the former presence of beavers, it's a perfectly credible account that she's given. Next slide. People have tried to protect beavers for a very long time. When we look at the modern legislation that's protected them under European community law, in the time of the Carolingian kings and their empire that spanned the Belgian-German border a thousand years ago, they appointed people called Beverari to ensure that all matters pertinent to the beaver were administered by the king's court and the animals were protected. Next slide. But they didn't protect them for reasons that were bound by anything other than utility. It was, you have to look even further back to a part of the world that was then civilized in ancient Iran 2,000 years before the birth of Christ, when it was known that if you killed a beaver, um, which was considered to be an incredibly holy animal, um, that the corn and the grass would cease to grow and that the killer must receive punishment. Next slide. The punishment for a killer of a beaver would be 60,000 dirhams, which was a substantial amount of money at that time. And in addition to that, they would have to go out to kill thousand snakes and to compensate for their sins. Next slide. Um, again, other writers, you know, who were also confused about this animal at the time, described it in a variety of different ways. Small black animal, small wild animal, black hair, um, and, and described again, talk, talked also about the um, the, the use of the castorium for different purposes. But Duad al-Antiki, who was a Syrian Christian, couldn't have actually seen one because he was blind. Next slide. Another zoologist um, in the Middle East, um, Damari, who lived between 1341 and 1405, also described the John de Bastard as having the forepaws, hind legs and a long tail. His head is like a human head. He crawls in his chest. So there's still considerable um, uncertainty about this creature, which provides such a, a valuable commodity, actually is. Next slide. Uh, we know they were in Syria because they're on the Teller tablets, engraved along with creatures like morale, which still exist in very limited numbers there to this day. Next slide. Um, and that they survive well into modern times because Western European um, expeditions looking at um, by the, uh, natural history in the 1800s record beavers being there then. Next slide. And other people were lucky enough to capture them and send them back to the London Zoological Gardens where there are no records today of the animal ever actually arriving. Next slide. But to go back to the, the understanding of the ancient Iranians, this is what happens when you remove a creature that holds water from the landscape. The ancient Iranians were right. You'd kill the water dogs. You remove this part of nature that's there to retain water and make the deserts green. And this is the modern world you inherit. Next slide. It's believed there are still beavers, perhaps. And in some parts of the Middle East, they may still, for example, exist in the same Turkey. Next slide. They say exist as far east still today as China, where they live. About 500 animals live a precarious existence in a dwindling habitat. Next slide. Despite nature conservationists trying very hard to preserve them, every single stick the beavers acquired is taken by people and used for firewood. And in the end, quite commonly, the dams they would otherwise create are grazed bare to the skeleton of the earth by herds of cattle and buffalo. Next slide. 
The trade in beavers, as I said earlier on, has been ancient. And just shortly in December, myself and colleagues will be going to a place called Castoria in Greece, named after the beavers, which were once an abundant part of the very successful fur trade there, to have a chat about whether it's possible to reintroduce them to Greece. Next slide. Interestingly, like uh, you know, the beaver had their patron saint, Saint Felix, and the Castorian Fur Association, um, you know, also has a, a, its patron saint, which is the prophet Elias. Next slide. The chairman of the Castorian Fur Association is obviously familiar with beavers to this day because you can see he stuck one to his upper lip. Next slide. Um, today, you can still buy beaver skins, which are modeled by, um, you know, fairly racy looking uh, Russian models, um, if you want to buy them in Castoria. But at the end of it all, there are no beavers there. Next slide. Um, this is the last beaver that was killed in Greece in 1837 um, in a different part of the landscape. And that's all that remains now of a species that was once extremely numerous in Roman times. Next slide. So the end of the story, we hope, is not going to be one that was killed at Messalingi in 839. We want to look at whether we can actually move beavers from Bavaria and whether abundant back into a landscape where they will do a considerable amount of good. And that this could be actually you know, quite a fitting project um, to, um, to uptake at this time when beavers have been restored to Eastern European life. I'm not going to have time today to talk to, to you about what happened in North America, but just understand that we now know from North American experience, when we look at, you know, we look, listen to old stories from the, the, the once fertile crest and look at pictures of the Middle East, that the removal of the beaver um, from, from North American environments, especially in the arid southern states, um, was followed almost immediately by ecological catastrophe. When you take this animal out of an environment which holds the water and the env in an environment that's otherwise arid, then the Iranians were right. The deserts come in um, and nothing ever grows. Next slide. As far as beavers and Britain are concerned, it's been the most incredible journey. One of the most gratifying things to see is the old relationships form. This is a photograph of a female water bull carrying its baby away um, as a result of a flood event. And it's almost certain that this baby has been adapted by this species, which needs beavers to create open, sunny, complex wetland landscapes and um, for them to survive in. Next slide. A whole host of species are, are starting to respond again to a relationship that's ancient. Birds like little grebes in a pond in Wales, which have raised three clutches this year, follow the beavers when they emerge from their lodges at night to hunt on the insects that the beavers disturb in the sediments at the bottom of the pools. Next slide. This is the beaver. This is a little grebe. They've been separated from each other by a thousand years, but in the, in the, in the looks they exchange, they know what each other does. Next slide. Beavers have played all sorts of you know, different functions in natural ecology. Some of them are very simple, such as just, you know, bursting the ice in early spring ponds. Big, heavy animals coming out of their lodges, climbing onto ice shelves, creating open water for ducks. Next slide. And they are creatures which can promote miracles. When I started the uh, twice pilgrimage to Bavaria to, 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 to run, um, you know, beaver management tours there over the course of the last 15, 20 years, Black birds like the black stork were unheard of. They didn't exist there. They'd gone a long time ago. Black storks indeed were virtually extinct as a breeding bird in Western Europe until beavers solidified um, their, their presence in countries like Belgium. And the last time I was in Belgium to see beaver management colleagues there, there were 88 breeding pairs of black stork returned to the, the dark valley woodlands where the beaver dams and many multiples provided them with an abundance of, of water beetles, small fish, amphibians, and a host of other prey species. These birds are beginning to overfly Britain now. And one day this bird, the Geraldus cambrensis, remember him from about a thousand years ago, talked about in his, his Irish um, travels as being uncommon in Ireland, but all the storks being black, could very well return to breed in Britain. It will not do so unless there are an abundance of beaver habitats. Next slide. We talk all the time about beavers. We talk all the time about flooding. This is what happens when you do what we've done to a countryside and you drain it completely so that all the water that hits the landscape then comes crashing down, canalized rivers and stream systems and hits our much larger um, human living infrastructure. Next slide. Um, this is what the rivers like the Y look like. 
you know, the, the, the afternoon after the heavy rain in the morning, they run the color of coffee. None of this should be any kind of surprise to any of us. We all know it's true. And, and in that coffee-colored river is a toxic cocktail of chemicals and pesticides that do incredible damage to species that, you know, once had an extensive ancient presence, like freshwater peril mussels, which are now reduced to tiny, a tiny relic population of animals in places like the Langorse Hatchery um, near Brecon, where all the baby mussels are now that, that are present to the Welsh population uh, are still surviving for the Welsh population. Slide. Beavers could be a way, uh, you know, which we have had the most ancient of relationships with, could therefore in future be our best of friends. We can build structures they can dam for us and they will maintain them for us for nothing. We can work together to make a better planet. Next slide. And we, can, we need to be intelligent about this. So people talk about beaver reintroduction in Britain, which they're doing quite widely today because DEFRA have um, announced a consultation on the future. Um, then they will tell you that, well, we don't want them in the Eastern arable landscapes, but it's the Eastern arable landscapes where the most damaging land use practices are actually in place. These are where um, you, you have, uh, again, chemicals, nitrates, fertilizers, very many different kinds of pesticides flowing out into water. And if you reinstall beavers in landscapes like this at appropriate ditch junctions by buying kidneys of land to allow them to filter this waste, then the water coming out might not exactly be good to drink, but it's a hell of a lot better than it was when it went in. Next slide. So beavers are something we should absolutely take to heart. They're a species which we have an ancient relationship with. They're a species which we know we can manage effectively and well. There's an abundance of evidence with regard to their, their, their management, um, you know, pragmatic management from both North America and Europe. We're going to learn nothing more about, um, you know, what we need to know to live once again with them uh, in Britain. All we need to do is something that we're not very good at doing as, spe as a species is exhibit, you know, for the first time perhaps ever in our existence, a, 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 a very significant modicum of tolerance. And if we do that and couple it with understanding, then the beaver can be our best of friends. And I'll finish at that point there. It's quarter past seven and leave time for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Derek. Um, the first question in the Q&A was actually for Liz. So um, um, we'll, we'll kick off. Um, can you give an update on um, the Blackburn Meadows situation? Uh, Blackburn Meadows situation in what could someone give me a clue in uh, what context of Blackburn Meadows situation? I don't know who answered. Oh, I didn't see that question. Sorry. Who was that? Could they expand a bit more? Who, who asked that question? Um. Hello, it was me. Um, oh, hello. <laughs> and I, we went there today on the way to Centenary Riverside and it seems somewhat neglected the information boards are very difficult to read now oh, yeah. And yeah. the hide is locked up and you can't actually see into open water at any point so sure yes so blackburn meadows is um is a sheffield city council owned site which um the wildlife trust has in the past been involved in uh, it has a, um, ser a series of wetlands, or it used to have, which were created uh, effectively on top of a closed um, landfill site, which requires water to be pumped up from the river and the canal in order to retain the water levels. So over time, the pumping has stopped working uh, and the site has gradually gone into decline. Uh, so there is a, a real question about uh, which we have been talking to the council about as to whether um, there is a way to restore a system whereby you can bring the water back into the wetlands because that's that's really the, the key question. Unfortunately, it was designed by somebody who put the wetlands on top of a hill. Great place and they're not water flowing into them. So they are literally fed by a wind pump and the wind pump has not been working for some time. So, um, yeah, we have been talking to the council about that site and we, we agree it does look quite neglected. Um, so, so, yeah, we, we will carry on asking the questions and trying to find out what the future of that site is. 
I hope that's a, a bit of bit of information. Perhaps not exactly what you wanted to hear, but uh, um, yeah, we're trying to work with the council to persuade them to, to to make a decision about how how to look after that site in the future because it it used to be a, an amazing wetland site and great for birds, of course. Thank you, Liz. Um, so we now have a few questions for Derek. So um, the first one is, is there any link between castorum and castor oil? No, castor oil comes from an Asiatic tree. There's absolutely no link whatsoever. Thank you, that was a, <laughs> a quick one. Um, are beavers lazy after being introduced? How long does it take them to start to have an impact on their environment? Um, well, beavers are individuals, and just like the rest of us, there are, there are beavers that like to sit on the sofa and watch TV, and there are beavers that will actually exhibit um, sterling examples of industry. Normally what happens is that if, if they have an abundance of grasses and reeds at the side of a river, there are spiral banks that beavers will seek to burrow into the river banks and exist by swimming up and down big rivers, feeding on grasses and reeds. It's just easy. Um, but once they're highly territorial and once areas, the best territories are used up, the expanding two-year-olds ultimately are forced into to minor water courses by the aggression of the other territorial holders. And then they will build many, very many developments and change quite radically. Thank you. And what do you think about beavers returning to Sheffield and Rotherham? I think they should be everywhere. As far as I can see, when I travel the length and breadth of Britain, there are vast areas of suitable habitat right the way through this landscape uh, that would support beavers. And the only reason that they're not there is because we killed them in the past and because we've been very slow to reorganise their return. We're now doing in Britain what the European nations you know, started to do in the time of Stalin. At the end of it all, we are just such slugs. It is beyond belief. We're the last major European range state to reintroduce the beaver. And at the rate we, are, you know, we used to be taking, it was incredibly likely the Vatican City would get there first. So I think the consultation is good. What worries me about the consultation is that it could be you know, a great smoke screen for a talking shop, which might achieve very little when it's done. Thank you very much. And um, where would they live with so much rubbish and so many dogs? Would they be at risk? Beavers can live in the coal fields of Silesia, where some of the worst pollutants um, in Germany, you know, permeate from the, the soils we've disturbed, you know, to, to, to etch, their, to eke their way out into watercourses. They'll live in urban landscapes, they'll live in quite polluted environments. If dogs go into the water to chase them, then the dogs generally come off worse. So they're a very adaptable species. They'll live right in the middle of towns and cities. They live in Augsburg and Vienna and Munich on the River Worm. And they're not an animal of remote wilderness or anything like it. They're adaptable. They're quite happy to eat roses and gardenias if they are available in numbers. And they'll pinch carrots and parsnips with wild abandon. So the idea of beavers living in urban environments really shouldn't be reason for for um, or, 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 or wonder. Thank you. Um, next question is, water quality in most UK river systems is very low. Mass sewage dis discharged by water companies run off from agriculture. Can beaver reintroduction help this? It will help it in part. If you've got beaver generated wetlands, which are complex, um, some, very many studies have shown that the, the, the water that's just polluted filtering into these, you know, it, so it contains things like um, phosphates from agriculture and phos the phosphate particles are attached to the silt particles by um, electron electrolysis. So um, beaver um, dam systems will strip 80% of the silts lost to agricultural pollution um, from the water course and retain them in the surrounding environments. Now, when you strip the, the silts out for the nitrates in the silts, then the nitrates promote the swift growth of semi-emergent and aquatic plant species. And these, as a result, become more succulent. When they're more succulent, they, they have larger um, communities of aphids and other sap feeders and then more predators of those. So beaver-generated environments offline in minor stream systems can do much um, to, to remove um, our pollutants from water. On big river systems, they have little in the way of uh, an effect. 
it's the animals living in, 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 the, in the off stream environments, uh, which can have a significant impact on water quality. Thank you. Um, we've got um, quite a large um, comment here from, from Catherine, which I'll read out to you and then perhaps you would want to comment. Um, it's, yeah, it's more of a statement than a, a question, but doubtless beavers would be um, invaluable in halting the nature emergency. However, there seems no change in the grip the NFU hold over the government. I'm convinced it is the intensive farming practices we have um, um, how in Scotland licenses have been increasingly granted to call beavers said to be causing damage. We need to stop the profit, intense farming, farmers killing wildlife to maximise profits. Only then will we stand a chance to rewild the countryside. I fully support the need for re the reintroduction of beavers. Okay, what do you want me to say about that then? Um, it's just, um, I don't know, Catherine, if you want to come on and ask a direct question following your comment or if you just want to comment. The situation in Scotland is abhorrent. It has come about because you had a, a Secretary of State for the Environment who's a big chum of the farming lobby and who liked to have his picture taken wearing a kilt at the Highland Show when he was pissed drinking whiskey with them. It's shocking that every single time you look at a consultation, and if you look at a consultation for the beaver um, um, reintroduction prospect that DEFRA have launched at the moment, you look at it, you fill it in, and when you get to the bit where it talks about stakeholders, all they talk about is landowners and fishermen and people who have an interest in, 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 in water use. What about you? There are 67 million of you in this island and 88,000 people who draw single farm payment from your taxes. Surely you should have a view as well because you're all stakeholders. This animal will change this landscape for nature emphatically. Without it, I've worked with water bowls for a quarter of a century or more. Without the return of this creature, it doesn't matter how many, how much fencing we put up to keep dogs out, how many ponds we dig, how many trees we cut down, how much fencing we put up to, to ensure that cattle don't trample the banks of rivers or streams down to nothing. Without beavers creating open, sunny, complex wetland habitats, again and again and again and again, this little creature is truly doomed. It has no future. It's Yeah, I did an interview for Radio 5, um, oh, I don't know, about a year ago. And they, ha they hauled one chap out of a right whine about beavers and how they were costing his, his farming operation £5,000 a year. That man got £144,000 from the taxpayers for, grow for, for, for farm subsidies, global war, anti-global warming initiatives, and for, and for creating you know, biodiverse landscapes. That was the 44,000 for the last two. Yet there was no room and all that money he got for beavers. It's a complete charade. It's completely wrong. And it's terrible that the nature conservation authorities in Scotland have gone hand in glove with the National Farmers Union and, and the Scottish land and uh, Scottish land in the States um, to, to present a court case to defend a court case raised by Trees Against Life, who are saying that they had no, no legitimate reason and acted illegally to kill the beavers in the Tay in the first place. That's my position with regard to the beavers in the Tay. I think it's a shocking example of collusion, which is really um, you know, repugnant. Thank you for, for those comments, uh, following Catherine's comment. Um, next question. When, if ever, is the lack of top predators likely to be an issue in terms of natural control of beaver, beaver numbers? Beavers, beavers control themselves. They're highly territorial, and very many beavers die when populations reach a certain carry capacity. I mean, there's, there's been a lot of work done on the mortality, for example, of kits when the population is already large, and very many more kits die um, when the population is at maximum carrying capacity than do when the population is expanding. At the moment, the beaver population in places like Scotland and in England, where they exist, on rivers well is expanding. So beavers are living long lives and having large litters and they're probably um, you know, mating at an earlier stage in life and um, surviving for longer than would otherwise be the case. Um, so, and when there are many of them and the territories are hemmed in by other beavers, then those other beavers will control. Um, you know, they'll, 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 there will be an element of self-control um, both through um, you know, infighting regulation, you know, lack of, of food resources and, and higher kit mortality um, than, than, than would be the case when they're, they're still at a growth period. 
there are some British predators which already kill them. So foxes will kill baby beavers, um, which are unwary foraging on land with their mums. Dog otters, um, you know, are also perfectly capable of, of killing baby beavers as well. So I think the whole the whole idea that you know we need to reintroduce top predators to control beavers is utterly unnecessary. In the end, where where they appear in environments like sewage farms or other intolerable. Um, you know, riparian um, environments where they simply can't be, then we will have to catch them and remove them. And sometimes we'll have to kill them. But at the end of it all, it's not a, a major concern. Uh, and we understand the mechanics of this very well from countries like Bavaria. Thank you. Um, are you optimistic that the new ELM system of farm subsidies will benefit rewilding and the reintroduction of species like beavers? Um, I think it could, and I think there are some people who will subscribe to it, who will behave very well, and who will do things that are 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 right and honourable. I think there are other people who will subscribe to it, who will only be interested in the money, and it will only be the money that dictates the way they act and where they think they can screw the system and 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 come up with cunning dodges. They will, without a shadow of a doubt, do so because it is in the character to act in that way. So I think it will be some and some. I think great good co could come from it, and probably in the end will, because there are many um, thinking about deeply and seriously about how they improve um, the cartilage and the, um, and, and, and the heart of their estates and lands um, for wildlife. And they have open minds and, and are not um, thinkers who are restricted in any sense, um, you know, by... by um, convention or or, 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 or or modern, straightforward nature conservation thinking. I think one of the biggest problems with regard to all this is the conservation movement, is that we're incredibly insular in our thought process and approach. We're incredibly risk averse, and that is not good. Uh, we're not used to producing a result at scale, and that is also not good. And I think nature conservation is going to have a lot of growing up to do if we're going to make kind of meaningful um, you know, inroads with regard to nature recovery in an island that in many parts is nearing death rapidly. Okay, thank you. And um, there's a question here that's probably more suited for you, Liz, um, as it's um, a more of a local question. So Radio Falls Farming today often talks to farmers who are interested in conservation and who even devote some of their land to rewilding. Are there farms like this in Sheffield and Rotherham so that the Wildlife Trust could work with them? Uh, well, uh, that's a good question, and we'd probably like to, to put that out more widely across Sheffield and Rotherham to find out if there are any farmers out there. Um, I mean, as I mentioned at the beginning of the evening in my own uh, presentation, we are working with some smaller farms, uh, tenant farms to, to the west of Sheffield in particular, but um, I mean, Derek talked about Rotherham and where there are some sort of much larger um, arable farms as well. And there's lots of potential right across um, Sheffield and Rotherham uh, to, to work with farms uh, on rewilding. But to um, a bit more over next year, um, we have planned to do it earlier, but obviously COVID has just sort of uh, sort of prevented a number of uh, things progressing, but we would really like to talk to any farmers, any landowners who are at all interested in rewilding or beaver reintroductions or, or just finding out a bit more about how they can help with nature's recovery. Um, so yes, if you do know any farmers or have contact with landowners and managers that you think might be interested, then please do um, put them in touch with us. We'd really you know, just have a very open conversation about what the opportunities might be. So please do. Someone's yeah, Wentworth Woodhouse. Yeah, yeah. We kind of know Wentworth Woodhouse uh, um, is an interesting one because obviously they uh, um, are quite a, a big private estate. Uh, so um, we have some contact with Wentworth Woodhouse. Um, so yeah, just I didn't realise the that beavers had sort of until quite recently been seen on, on that side. And you guys, <laughs> you, Sheffield City Council, I completely forgot this, you have the menagerie archives for Wentworth Woodhouse. Right, who can look those up? 
I've seen one page for them where they talk about llamas and various other things. It would be really, really useful if somebody had a minute to go and check and see if there's any mention of beavers at all, which could quite easily have been got from the Hudson's Bay Company in those records. That would be very, very useful. So the Wentworth Woodhouse estate from the, from the original house? Uh, the yeah, Philip from the original Hale house. The, rec the records are lodged with Sheffield yeah, City Council. Yeah, yeah. I forgot about that. Yeah, I'm sure we can try and find do our best. Yeah. Really useful. <laughs> okay, um, we've just had another question come in um, for you, Derek. Um, too many houses are built on floodplains. Uh, beavers might um, help, uh, help make this better or worse, so might be blamed for floods um, unpersecuted. Once again, it's more of a statement, but uh, do you have any opinions on that? Of course there would be. At the end of the day, we're always good at blaming farmers or indigenous people or people we don't like. We'll always find a scapegoat, and animals are, are, are commonly the easiest scapegoat to come by. Just look at what's happening with badgers. So, of course, people will blame beavers for a whole amount of nonsense that they'd absolutely nothing to do with. But at the end of it all, all you can hope for is that as we, in theory, move forward intellectually as a species, that we become a lot more sober and rational in our own trends of thought and understand that that's not going to get us out of the hole that we've dug ourselves into. So I'm sure, yes, believers will be blamed, but it won't um, mask the fact in the end that the, that the problem is one that's been made by us. Thank you. And another question, um, maybe um, best for you, Liz, although um, whether you can answer, because it's more of a national question. Um, is the Wildlife Trust nationally talking to major landowners um, like the National Trust, the Crown Estate or the Forestry Commission? If they won't play ball, why would small farmers? Well, I, I don't know that we would necessarily be talking nationally anyway. I think it will be done on a case by case basis. So, for, for instance, um, you know, Devon Wildlife Trust, I'm sure Derek uh, knows that, you know, there's been a lot of work done uh, by Devon Wildlife Trust for beaver reintroduction, and they would work with whichever landowners were relevant to that particular. Um, river course so um, it might be the National Trust it might be Forestry Commission it might be so basically while just work with whoever they need to uh, in a local patch and um, you know for instance uh, in, in other parts of, of our patch you know Yorkshire Water are actually quite an important landowner to work with in terms of beaver reintroduction and um, uh, you know to some extent the Forestry Commission but again we'd look kind of regionally to talk to the Forestry Commission about particular <laughs> sites so that's how we uh, we tend to to look at it is um, working on a site-by-site -site basis as best we can but um, I, I imagine there is some national work going on as well to respond to the beaver strategy and you know consultation as positively as possible by all environmental NGOs um, so that, that's as much as I, I'm aware of. Thank you. Um, we've got a few more minutes for questions, so I'm going to just ask the last couple that we've just had in the chat. So Derek, when releasing beavers, what is the minimum area size in which a pair of beavers should be introduced? Typically the literature will tell you that beavers will have a, a very high quality habitat, they'll live a linear territory of about three kilometres but in very, very high quality habitat. Britain affords much of this. It won't be three kilometers. It might be five, 600 meters. We have beavers that escaped from our holding facilities here on our farm about 10 years ago. And, and some of those beaver families have territories that might be, oh, 200 meters, 200 meters in ditch length, but they've moved off to ponds and pools either side and exploiting the, the riparian woodland around those 200 metres of ditch. They're virtually touching the next beaver family down and they're getting on just fine. So everything depends on habitat quality. If you have high quality habitat, the territorial spaces may be small. If you have poor quality habitat, they will be much. Can't be any more. Thank you. And uh, the final question to you, Derek. Um, beavers utilise large number of trees. How can we ensure that we can provide sufficient trees for them throughout the landscape that they are currently colonising? Are we going to have to control deer numbers across the UK to allow sufficient trees to regenerate? Huh. 
Well, if you look at parts of Britain which have been near completely ruined by principally sheep grazing, where you're looking at bare riparian corridors which have no trees left, then yes, you may need to plant trees. If you fence the sheep out or reduce stocking numbers, the beavers will of course use the riparian vegetation and the tall grasses and herbs along the sides of the rivers. But in response to the second part of that question about the deer, the deer are a major nightmare coming without a shadow of a doubt. There's no coordinated policy to deal with them in England. It's reckoned that the populations of Sika red, raw, fallow Chinese water deer and munchai are rising by about 10% a year. I was at Site Nashdown Forest about two months ago where we, we went through an area that had deer exclusion fence and it was pretty full of primroses, pendulous sedge, everything else. And you walked out the other end and honestly, there wasn't a bleed of green on the forest floor. No regeneration at all. The stream banks collapsing into... To what was a major water course, but it was in essence just a corridor sludge. And when I asked the landowner there about whether there was arable farming in the upper catchment that was causing this, and he said, no, it's just the fallow deer. It's impossible. In the end, we are going to have to take a deep breath at some stage in the same way the Americans have done with Project Forget we are going to have to think about reintroducing the wolf. There'll be no other solution to this problem if we want to have forests that survive in the, in the future. And if you look at Aldo Paul Leopold's writing in the 1920s and 1930s, when he wrote his book called, you know, or his essay called Thinking Like a Mountain, and he made it very clear that the mountains weren't scared of the predators that people were killing left, right, and center to protect the herds of big game. They were terrified of those herds of ungulates, which would strip themselves right bare down to the skeleton, leaving absolutely nothing left. So this is something as a debate that's coming. We begin with the beaver, and the beaver starts us down a route, um, you know, uh, uh, as a journey, which will, will ultimately lead to, to, to us having to reassess um, the options for other species as well. But as far as the deer are concerned, there will, in the end, be no other solution if we want to have growing future forests other than to look at the predators at some point in time. Great, thank you very much, Derek. Um, and finally, just before I pass back to Mark, um, this one's um, for you, Liz. As the Woodland Trust are very keen on beavers, are there any opportunities for Sheffield Rotherham Wildlife Trust to work with them? Yeah, it's a bit of a similar um, point to before, really. Um, and we, you know, we do already work with the Woodland Trust a lot, um, particularly in South Yorkshire, and we have quite a good partnership with them in, around woodland creatures, not surprisingly. So, um, yeah, uh, uh, you know, uh, once I think there's an um, agreement around where and how we reintroduce beavers uh, and the, the enough has been done to persuade people to accept them, which I know Derek's uh, been doing for, for a long time. And uh, we, we do that ourselves. Then, you know, there'll be plenty of partners, I'm sure, that we can work with to, to make that happen. But um, we need to make sure that we can get the agreement of the landowners that would be most affected where we would introduce them. So that's, that's the first port of call, really, um, and how that would be received by um, people locally is important. So uh, I think, you know, as this is probably the last question by the looks of it, um, you know, we, we do really want to hear from, from you. And as Derek said, uh, we hear a lot about um, the potential impact, negative impact of, of beavers uh, on um, some particular um, crops and uh, uh, industries. We also could do with really hearing from people like you, our members and our supporters about, you know, what you want to see. And if you think it's a positive thing as well, you know, there's two sides to this, this um, coin. So if you if you have a view and I can see some of you are really interested and positive about that from the chat, then please do make your voice heard in the in the consultation. Please keep in touch with us and and let us know if you if you want to be involved or if you if you just sort of simply support the approach because you're our members so we kind of want to 
to hear from you if uh, this is something that you think we should be taking forward. So do, so do let us know that um, either tonight or, or in the future and do look at the um, Beaver Strategy Consultation as well uh, and, and try and put across your point of view. Great, thank you very much, Liz. Um, I'll pass back to Mark, who will give a big thank you to our guest speaker. Thanks, Tanya. Yeah, thank you, Derek. And that, that was a, a, I love the wonderful and fascinating stories about the human um, uh, interrelationship with uh, beavers over the years. And um, <laughs> it's fantastic research and the tantalizing glimpses of how they faded out in this country, unfortunately. And, um, you know, we at Sheffield and Rotherham Wildlife Trust, you know, we, 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 we Water bills are very close to our hearts, and uh, hopefully beavers will be soon. So we uh, wish you very well in your best wishes in your work in the future, and I hope that all goes very well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good. And so, so everybody, um, well, that brings us to the end of our first session, which is for oh, okay, clap. Sorry, clap. Hey, that's fine. Thank you very much for It's kind of a bit odd doing it in a room on your own, but <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Good night. Tea time. Thank you, Derek. Thank you. Bye-bye. Cheers. <laughs> right. Uh, right. Sorry. Um, yeah. So that brings us to the, the end of our first session. Um, and uh, the next session is for members only. So thank you, everybody else that's been on. Um, uh, you know, uh, pl pl please uh, log off now. Uh, we'll be back at uh, 8 o'clock for the AGM. And uh, anybody who hasn't met John can join during that quarter an hour session and can join us at eight o'clock. Thank you. See you later. Bye.